For our next speaker, we're delighted to welcome Hussein Mahana, the head of AI at Cruise. Hussein is joined by Brad Porter, CTO at Scale AI, and previously VP of Robotics and Distinguished Engineer at Amazon. Brad, over to you. Well, welcome everyone. I'm incredibly excited to have the opportunity to host this, this fireside chat with uh, Hussein Mahana of, of Cruise. And Hussein, I, I think I'll let you, you introduce yourself and give, give us a little bit of your background. Thank you, Brad. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Um, so my name is Hussein. I lead the AI group at Cruise. We're an autonomous vehicle company headquartered here at San Francisco. Uh, our mission is to liberate folks from the perils of driving and, uh, and the effort uh, required for that, and also liberate cities from pollution, because our uh, fleet is 100% uh, electric. Um, regarding my background, I, I started uh, uh, with AI and machine learning through my speech recognition uh, master's at, at Cambridge. And then I worked at uh, Microsoft on speech and uh, search. After that, I also worked at uh, Facebook, where I co-founded the applied research team there and the machine learning platform. And then I wanted to work on uh, AI, but in, applied to different industries. So I thought that joining Google Cloud would be a great idea, and it was. Um, I got uh, amazing exposure um, through multiple industries. But that's also where I came across Cruise uh, and the autonomous vehicle industry, and I felt that um, the, the, that robotics is where the real deal is uh, in terms of machine learning, and uh, here I am now. So I'm curious, what, what opinion have you developed about AI that, uh, that might be controversial or, or people <laughs> might not agree with? Well, I, I don't believe that AI can turn a bad product into a good one. So um, I see a lot of times people trying to use AI in all sorts of ways, um, and I encourage them to focus on their product, and if AI is the right tool for it, then so be it. No, I think that makes perfect sense. Um, and, and you've talked about this concept of, of being an AI native company. Um, how do you think of AI native versus maybe AI first or an AI transformation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I believe AI native companies build uh, AI native products. And that's a product that um, from the get go cannot exist even in an MVP form without AI. As an example, um, voice assistance, um, uh, the document understanding solutions that I think uh, Scale is building and autonomous vehicles. So from the get-go, if you don't have AI or machine learning, the product won't really be meaningful. This is sort of opposed to AI-enhanced or optimized products. So if you think of e-commerce, uh, it has existed without AI, but obviously with AI, it has been massively enhanced. And I think this is important because AI native products require a different methodology of, of building them um, that needs to go beyond uh, the lean startup, in my opinion. Uh, the lean startup is very focused on learning, but with AI native products, you need a continuous sort of learning machine that is automated so that you can get the product to the uh, human level that, or surpassing the human level that it's uh, supposed to operate at. Now, if you look at AI first, uh, this concept, I'm not a fan of it because I think the customer should be first. And with AI first, it almost sort of turns the problem into an AI hammer that makes everything else look like an AI nail. So I'm not super uh, fan uh, of that. Now, AI transformation is a great concept, in my opinion. Um, and it means that companies can leverage AI to do um, um, things that they couldn't do before, and that's fine. But again, AI first, in my opinion, misses the mark. I think the, um, one of the interesting challenges in the industry is how to bring AI in alongside software, or, or even how to organize AI initiatives, right? Mm -hmm. How do you, um, there's kind of a collegial spirit of, of shared progress in, uh, in the AI research community, and yet there's a lot of just hardcore engineering pieces to be done. How do you think about that interaction between, between teams? How do you build an yeah. organization that can do that seamlessly? That's a great question. So um, in academia, often efforts are mostly focused on modeling because academia operates off of standardized data sets. And that makes sense in academia. But when you go to the industry, it's completely different. 
the machine learning life cycle or development cycle is far more sophisticated and it often spans multiple teams and therefore it is very easy for silos to operate, to, to exist between teams, like teams that generate data, teams that do modeling and so on. Um, at Cruise, we've decided to, to take a different perspective and we've built the mindset of a continuous learning machine. We are not building a model or a bunch of models, like you know, a powerful model like GPT-3. We are actually building a machine that has a closed feedback loop. So the cycle requires us to move away from the waterfall mindset that people sometimes use to build machine learning models to this closed loop. Um, and we found that this helps to a large extent break silos. So I would like to give you a concrete example. Um, at, at Cruise, it's very important for us as our car drives uh, uh, on the streets to turn every mile into some gradient that our neural networks can learn from. And in order to do that, it's very important for the modeling engineer not to assume that, you know, they're going to build a model off of a one drop of a data set. Actually, it's a continuous stream of data. And therefore, they don't build a model, but they build a modeling solution that assumes a constant stream of data. Therefore, they have to make sure that every iteration that is trained of the model does not regress because you, you might get bad data. So therefore, they have to collaborate with the data team much more rigorously uh, to build such a solution. So we found that this mindset shift is extremely useful. Yeah, make makes incredible sense. You, you said something earlier where um, uh, you observed that academia often operates off of, um, off of existing data sets. Um, and, and you kind of said it axiomatically as if that makes perfect sense. I'd, I'd love for you to expand a little bit um, why, that, why that makes perfect sense, but why it's maybe different to yeah. the industry. So for academia, often it's about comparing the effectiveness of modeling techniques. And so you, you, you really need a controlled environment where if the data sets are different, then it's very hard to compare the powerfulness of two modeling techniques. Um, so therefore, it kind of makes sense so that you, you can create these benchmarks. On top of that, I think that in academia, it's harder for them to get access to data sets like autonomous vehicle data sets or search data sets and so on. So there is value to create these data sets and, and they're often not created as a, as a continuous stream of data. Um, and then in this new economy, data is, is sort of the new business advantage. And so, you know, um, I think companies are investing massively uh, on creating these very sophisticated data loops. Um, which cost billions of dollars and therefore might be hard to offer for free at, at academia. Um, and that's why there's a 